Alrighty. Let's now take a look at where we are in the course. Some reminders. Let's make sure everything is clear before we move on. Your programming test number one, we are finalizing the result and we should be able to return by next Monday. If I can return maybe earlier, I'll definitely do that. But Monday next week the latest. And your written test number two, sorry, written test number one tomorrow during your enroll lab session. So please make sure you bring your sketch, uh, own sketch paper if you need it. Uh, keep both sides blank and make sure you bring your photo ID. It is important for check-in, all right? And your lab number four has been released. Let me emphasize, if you don't really do anything until tomorrow, that's understandable, but you want to start right away after the written test number one tomorrow. Let me show you where the lab four and written uh, programming test number two are going to relate it to each other. All right, let's now take a look at the calendar here. Okay, so we are now over here, lecture 12. And then tomorrow we're going to do your written test number one. I would suggest you want to really get started with part one of your lab number four. If you have already opened the instruction, you will know what I'm talking about. So there are two parts for your lab number four. Part number one is very similar to the celebrity problem, but it's not a new problem. It's a, like a, more like a hardware component, like an interesting one, pretty simple. So I would say do part one as, as soon as you can, hopefully complete it by next Monday. Part one shouldn't take too much of your time. And then for part number two, it's going to be the more challenging bit. So this time we require you in lab number four to interact with the road improver, but in a very constrained way. So we put every possible step-by-step -step instruction there for you to interact with the prover. So it should be very self-contained. So this will be something you want to mark on your calendar. So for October 30th, during the scheduled lab session from 1.30 to 3.30, uh, one of the TAs who will actually help me design the lab, he will be there in the lab session. So if you've got any questions specific to the prover or anything to do with the insight into the lab, please show up to uh, that particular lab session. You can do 1.30 or 2.30, doesn't matter. All right, so that's really something I want to emphasize. So please make sure if you don't really usually come to the Q&A, if you don't need it, that's okay. But for lab number four, I will imagine some of, some of you might run into issue with understanding. So you really want to show up to the October 30th lab session. The TA will be there. All right, I cannot emphasize enough. And then after that, after your lab number four is due, your programming test number two is going to be primarily based on lab number four. I'm also going to release some practice tests for you as well for lab, uh, programming test two. Maybe uh, early next week, I'll do that. So you guys want to get started with lab four as soon as you can. All right, so, and as for the exam, I don't know yet. I only know the tentative date, which I'm not supposed to really say. But I would say, let's wait for the official date for the exam, which should be released pretty soon. Uh, once we know about the uh, official date for the exam, hopefully that will give us enough gap to maybe schedule one or two review sessions to help you with the course content. We'll see. Uh, if I can do it, we can definitely find some time. All right, let's now see if there's anything else I didn't mention. Yeah, complete part one as soon as you can. And also for part number two, you want to mark on your calendar October 30th. The, the TA is going to be there to help you. And of course, if you still want to make use of my office hour, you're yeah, welcome to. That's always the case. All right, any question about a course? Yes. So is you mean the format is going to be the same? No, no, no. Like the, the short answer questions, are they going to be auto-marked or is the Oh, it's going to be auto-marked. So everything in the written test is, is going to be auto-marked. So the amount of text that you will be expected to type will be very similar to the practice test I gave to you. Mm -hmm. Similar. All right? Good. Okay. And then, uh, anything else you guys want me to clarify before I move on? Okay, but anytime, just uh, interrupt me. So why don't we do a very quick recap about where we were before the reading week, and now we can continue. All right, so I think I want to mainly focus on the uh, bridge controller part that we started 
on Thursday. And I think that there was a small part from, from the Thursday before the reading week, we spoke briefly about how you can formalize the array as a function. That's something you can also read the slides and reach out to me if you got any question. Okay, I know that there was a minor issue there, but it's not really major. That's something I promise I'll come back after the reading week. I'll do that maybe Thursday, right? That's something I'll definitely come back. I still remember it. All right, so very quick recap. So we talk about this methodology here, correct by construction. Always start with some very, very simple and abstract model, gradually refine the details into subsequent model. And we just started with the bridge controller M0. And by the end of the semester, we're going to see M0, M1, M2. But three models there are already quite a bit of detail that we can learn from there. We'll see gradually. And then we talk about the state space, which is important. Here's the principle. The more variables you have for your model, the larger the state space it is. So the idea would be the initial model here should have the, uh, should have the least number of variables meaning that you should have the smallest state space. It's because the, sm uh, the state space is so minimal, it should be easier for you to argue about certain properties for the initial model. But once we introduce more and more variables, we will just have to make sure we only try to uh, prove a small number of properties in addition. We don't try to do everything in a single model. Right? That's really the key about the approach we learned in this course. All right, so that's about the... Uh, configuration you know, for the state space. And we're going to see something very similar today as well. And so that's the entire requirements documents for the bridge controller. But I would say for the coming one week or two, we are only going to focus on this requirement here. Requirement number two, the number of cars on the bridge and the island is limited. That's the only thing we're going to focus on. Once we get to model number one, the refinements, we're going to see more requirements being addressed. Not yet. Okay. And this will be the conceptual model you want to know. So we don't really make any distinction between the island and the bridge. So that's the main abstraction we actually have for the initial model. So you can think about we are seeing this whole scene from the very high on the sky. We cannot even see there's a bridge in the middle. That's okay. We just want to make sure whatever cars that that's on the bridge and the island, we consider them as one unit. That's the main abstraction we have. Yeah, that's something I said earlier. You can also review it. And that's really the initial model we have. Are we gonna see gradually how we can use math to help us identify problems in the model? Okay, we'll see. So we got constants, we got axiom, assumed to be true. We also got machine. And we got only one variable. So the state space is relatively small. Only one variable to worry about. And we got two invariants. N should be a natural number. Should be larger than or equal to zero. And also it should be limited. Should be constrained. Like how the balance is constrained by the upper limits in the bank example. All right. Okay, so let's see. Okay, I believe that's the last one, right? So before the reading week started, we actually did this uh, little practice over here. When you were given uh, the state space, in this case n, and you're given the constraint invariance, which you always hold true. And we were kind of asking, can you see any problem about these two events? We kind of did it in a in more informal way. So the way to, one way to really verify is to figure out what we call event trace. You can see we, after initialization, if you do ML out one, two, three, three times, that you're going to reach some n that is strictly larger than two, the maximum. In that case, it's already violates invariance. So that's one way to show the invariant violation, which is to show that from the beginning of the system, uh, you have a trace which can lead you to a state where the invariant is violated. That's one way to do. But later on, we're gonna see if it is possible to just do some proof. If the proof obligation can be discharged or can be proved, that means invariant is, is preserved. Otherwise, it's violated. It's actually a more efficient way to do things. All right, that's something we'll definitely touch upon either later today or Thursday. But I think it's always good to really learn the more intuitive approach for now. All right, any question from before the reading week? If not, why don't we move on? 
All right, so let's now take a look at, okay, that's your written test practice question from the review session. Okay, let's now talk about it before after predicate. So let's see the context here. So we want to look at our system here, and the system contains two parts, the static part and the dynamic part. And that one is more like an abstract state machine. Well, the name sounds fan uh, fancy. It's basically a bunch of states with transition in between. That's what we really meant. Let's uh, uh, go over the definition. The system, especially for reactive system, like a bridge controller, it never terminates. It might just go inside a loop, which is OK. And then it's going to involve as actions of enable event change values of the variable subject invariant. What does that really mean? That means the following. So what we have is abstract state machine. So abstract state machine, that's what we have. So what we are saying is the very first event that's going to take place is always the in initialization. Well, sometimes we just say init. Right? If you recall what's in row then, we do have some initialization event there. That one, they're just going to put all the variables into the initial value. And this will be the initial states. And what's so important about it, this initial state, that's where everything will begin. And then the property that must be satisfied over here is the invariance. Invariance must be established for the very first time. Conceptually. All right. And then from the initial states, here we actually have, so of course, you know, the state here, uh, for example, n could be equal to zero, for example. And then from that state, we have to somehow figure out what are the possible events that are actually enabled. So now let's talk about enable, the idea. In general, if you have a, a events, let's say, for example, the example I can give to you will be something like, you know what, let me put this into a new page. That might be a little bit better. Okay, so now what I want to talk about is the transition of events. Transition of an events. Okay, I'm going to talk about several concepts over here. Let's say we'll talk about withdraw. And if you recall, we actually got the withdraw event from your lab number one. All right, so we got the account, which should be in the domain account. And also we got V, which should be, let's say, natural number. And then we actually got some constraint on the parameter. So A should be in the domain of B. And remember, B is a balance function, right? It will map from account. Let me just remind you quickly. So B is actually from the account partial function to the natural number, the balance, let's say. Okay. And then we have the V. Uh, I think that's good enough for now. Begin, and we got the action. So here we say B should be substituted, or B becomes B, and then overridden. Okay, that's an overridden symbol, and then we're going to say now only A is going to be changed. Maps to B of A minus V. You might be saying, maybe you're missing a guard for withdrawal. Yes, I do, intentionally. All right? I'm going to talk about it in just a moment. Because somehow you want to make sure the value you want to withdraw is not too big so that you get below the credit limit. You might be thinking about that. But that's OK. I'll get there in just a moment. All right, so that's the events, more or less, that you learned from lab number one. And 
here we want to talk about how we can make a transition for the events. You want to think about there are always two states for you to consider. In order for me to really take a transition from a state to another by the withdrawal events. Right? That's conceptually what's happening. And it's going to be true for every event. Let's clarify some terminology here. Number one, the states where you start the transition is called pre-states. And the state where the event terminates and ends is called post-states, pre and post. All right. So let's talk about pre-state first. In the pre-states, usually there are two things that should be satisfied, should be evaluated into true. Okay. So now in the pre-state, we should really say it should be green, meaning that it's safe. And there are two things that should be satisfied. Number one, the guard of the events. In this case, withdraw. Because if the guard is not really true, then the event is said to be disabled. Okay? So we also say the guard is called an enabling condition. of the events. And for now, we only got one, which is, they, which is to say, as long as you can give me an account that's in the domain of B. And also, you got V, which is a natural number, I'll let you do withdraw. Almost like an unconditional, which can be potentially problematic. But the point is, you have to make sure, number one, the guard must be true, so the events over here will be enabled. Okay? So you want to say, withdraw over here, must be enabled to happen, to occur. Okay, that's number one. Number two is about the invariance. Number two is the invariance, usually we say just I, must be true to begin with. That means you must start the events transition in a state that's considered safe. If you start with the unsafe states, you cannot do transition. In our case, let's now make the uh, assumption. We only got one invariance. Let's say invariant i is here. We say for every account, a in the domain of the balance function, and b of a should be larger than or equal to minus C. I'm pretty sure you have seen this many times, right? That's why I chose this example, this example again. So that's my invariance. I want to make sure before I do the withdrawal for this particular account, I want to make sure every account, including A, they must be larger than or equal to minus C for their own balance. That's what I want to make sure before the event occurs in the pre-states. Usually, proof obligation would be expected to be discharged when you reach the post states over here. Okay. So now I'm going to put a question mark over here. Question mark simply pose the following question. Is the post states after the event's action takes effects still safe. So here, when I say safe, I really meant to say, is the main invariant still maintained? Is I maintained? That's really the question. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit more elaboration on this, to just to show you. Are we okay so far? Right, it's really important because it's going to be the same pattern for every event that we need to talk about. And hopefully we can reach uh, either today or on Thursday, we're going to reach to formulate about a proof obligation for invariance. It's going to correspond to this, but this is more intuitive right now. Okay, let's now think about the following. 
I'm going to put it here. Okay. We know that in the pre-states, we know that I is true. Let's not worry about guard just yet. All right. What about in the post states? So here, I remains to be true. And now, how do we formulate this a little bit further so we can manipulate it like a math? The way to do it is I over here, and then if I just copy that down. So for every A, A is a member of the domain of B, implies the B of A larger than or equal to minus C, right? That's the invariance. But now I'm going to do a little bit change. I want to somehow reflect on the invariance that somehow withdraw has already done some update to the states. Specifically, this is the action that has been doing the updates. So what I want to do is, I want to somehow use this one here. Okay? So this is so-called the effects of the event action. And the event action says the following. In the post states, the B is going to become just like the original B, except it has been overridden by specifically for account A. And A is now going to become B of A is going to map to B of A minus V. All right, so now I'm just going to do some substitution. Based on the effects over here, the only thing that's going to impact will be this one here, B here and B over here. All right. So the B here is now going to be replaced by this particular expression. I need to write it down 100% so that you can refer to it a little bit later. And this example here, the replacement ju might just become a little bit complicated. And the one we're going to do later for the example will be slightly easier. But it's good to start with something a little bit more complicated. That's fine. Let's now take a look. OK, this will be the final bit I want to mention. But I already talked about the pre-state and also post-state. That's important. And also I talk about enabling condition for the events, which can only happen if the guard guarding condition is actually true. The final bit, let's now be very uh, precise about what's going to happen. Invariance I in the pre-states looks like for every A, A in the domain of B, and then A larger than or equal to minus C. And since we got A already, so why don't I change the name? So that'll be a little bit easier for us to see. We can easily change the dummy variable name just to avoid confusion. How about X? OK, just X, because we got a parameter of the event called A. And here we got some event action. Event action there. Event action say, I'm going to change the B over here. And we say that B is going to become B overridden with A maps to B of A minus V. Okay, so this is the event action. So now, I in the post state is going to look something a little bit different. In the post states, it's going to look like this. We still got for every X, and then X is in the domain of, now, rather than just writing B, B has already become this particular expression with account A being overridden, right? So now what we want to do is something like this. The domain of B 
overridden with A, maps to B of A minus V. Okay, let me write it down and then I will recap. And then implies X larger than or equal to minus C. I can possibly write this one here. All right. This is some kind of exercise we will have to do, which is to have the, we have the same invariance I over here. And then in order to show that the same invariant is going to remain true in the post states, we have to somehow do some massaging on the invariance in such a way that whatever event action that's going to take place, sometimes it could be multiple actions in the events, in which case we got to do multiple massaging on the parts of the invariance. But the point is, take the same invariance and copy down over here. For every variable that's being modified by the events, we have to make sure we replace the new value of the variable and put it exactly here. So now here in the pre-state is B. In the post-state is this particular new B. Right? If you remember in the relational overriding or any relational operator, you were just gonna give us a new relation over here. Okay? That would be something very important for you to write. This is the new value of B in the post-states. of withdrawal. Yeah, for today, we're not going to go any further to say how you can prove this on paper. That might be a little bit more complicated than uh, what we want to discuss, but at least you know that the same invariance can be expressed in the post states. But the only thing is you want to make sure replace all the impacted variable by its new expression. That's the thing. All right. I can prepare maybe another example for Thursday. We can do something maybe a little bit easier. I think this one here kind of shows you something you did earlier in the lab. Are we okay with this? About this uh, summary here? Invariance and also enabling condition and also the uh, pre and post states. That's important. All right, let's now go back to the slides and see what's missing. Enable versus disable. And also ML out, ML in, we got different action here. And we spoke about last time about having some event trace that's going to show you some violation of the invariance, right? That's something we covered already last time. And before, after predicate. That's something just one step further. All right, so before, after predicate, I will say a little bit more here. So when you write in Roden, you will actually say the colon equal. Hey guys, hello, please. Yeah, you've been uh, like this for quite a, quite a while. All right. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the effects for the events. So we basically say that n becomes n plus one, right? The way to interpret this is, is I could become. I would say, I'm gonna show you one example there. It's not very uh, appropriate to think of them as just programming assignment. It's not appropriate to do it, okay? What you want to think about is the n here on the left-hand side, it tells you what's going to be the post-state value. The post-state's value, n. And this one here tells you what it should become. This will be the pre-state value plus one. What that means is, if I try to visualize this, this is what's gonna happen. If I got two state here, the pre and post states, and this will be the pre, and this will be the post. And I want to have a transition be, uh, using ML out. At the moment, you can see that there is no guard for ML out, meaning that its guard is simply just true. It's always enabled. For example, if I have the pre value being simply two, Let's say n is equal to 2. All right, and then according to this action over here, we say that 
the post state value over here, which I'm going to put as n here, is going to be the pre state value plus one. This value here plus one, which will be just three. All right. It is important to notice that n here is the post states. The n here is the pre states. As you can see, can, we can already see some slight confusion here because you're talking about n, but whenever you talk about n, do you really mean the n in the pre or the n in the post? So that's why mathematically, we have to learn a notation which is called before after predicate over here. And the principle over here is very simple. For every variable that in, that's in the pre states, you just put a prime afterwards to create a post state value. So now here, if you think about the pre-state value is simply n, the post-state value is simply n prime. That will be much easier to see the difference. And now, given this particular action here, n becomes n plus 1. That will simply correspond to the post-state value, which is n prime, is equal to the pre-state value n plus 1. So you can always use uh, the prime to really distinguish between. All right. So this is the post states. And that one there is equal to the pre-state value plus one. Okay, we can do some exercise in just one moment, but it is important to see that. Okay. For each variable x, number one, we write x without any prime to denote its pre-state value. Number two, we write x prime to denote its post-state value. Yeah, the principle is very simple, but it's important to go through them. Pre-state versus post-states. X versus X prime. Okay. Again, let me uh, say one more thing. Whenever you're in rodent, you have to follow this syntax over here. So you're going to say the variable in the post-state becomes whatever expression it is. However, when we do more mathematical reasoning, we have to create a prime version of the variable to denote the post-states. So think about this is for rodent. This is for mathematical reasoning. This is more for row than the tool. And the before after predicate here is more for reasoning. Especially proof obligation. Okay, but we just need the two notations. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, that you run ML out twice, right? Mm -hmm. And then in your guard, you have something regarding n. Now that you're assigning to n prime, when you check your guard, what, what are you checking? Are you checking n prime still? Are you talking about two occurrences of ML out, which is one? Two occurrences. Two occurrences. Okay, sure, sure. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. It's more like a relative. Let's now consider this trace here. Let's say we got, let's say init followed by ML out, followed by ML out. Let's say, right? And if you recall from before, what we had earlier, let's use this particular example where we actually got D, all right, and ML out is actually going to increase the N, right? Let's use the same example. And I'm going to show you how the guard is going to be evaluated. But in this case, it's a little bit easier because there's no guard, as if it's true. What's going to happen is we have the init, which is by definition going to initialize n to be 0. And we, have, we assume that d is equal to 2, the maximum. Okay. So and now, think about for the very first occurrence, okay, we want to have m out. And just an aside, the action 
for ML out is N becomes M plus 1. Okay, that's a reminder. And as for the guard, it, you can see that there is only the action, there's no guard. When there's no guard, it's as if it's true. It's always enabled. The guard for ML out is simply just true. That means always enabled. But hypothetically, why don't we just change its guard to be something so we can see, okay? Hypothetically, say n should be, let's say, uh, larger than or equal to 1. Oh, how about this? Sorry. Only that, okay? Let's say this is the guard. For the inits, we're not really uh, taking any um, MLL. So now, in this case, are we able to let MLL occur? Yes, because here, you can see here, n equals 0 in the pre-states. So n will be 0. So 0 less than or equal to 1. You can, you can see we replace n by here. So it will evaluate to true. So that means it should be enabled. And when it is enabled, we will consider here n to be 0, and n prime over here will just be n plus 1. 1. All right? And now when we get to this particular state over here, you can now see if we try to evaluate it, 1 less than or equal to 1. Still true. Still enabled. And we can do one more. And if you try to do it again, we can do another ML out. Now, whenever we talk about pre-state and post-state, it's not really absolute. There's no like an absolute pre-state for everything. There's also no absolute post-state for everything. It's relative. As far as this pair of state is concerned, this is pre and this is post. As far as this particular pair of state is concerned, this is pre and this is post. All right, so now let me use a different color. You can think about n over here, the pre-state is equal to one. And if you evaluate the guard, it's true. So that's why MLL can happen once more. And what about n prime? It's going to be n plus one, which will be two. All right, so once we get to that state, if, is it enabled again? Not really, because now if you try to uh, evaluate, 2 less than or equal to 1. False. So that's disabled. So we are not able to have MLL happen anymore at this point, unless we change the value for the variable. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Good. OK, let's now try to do one little exercise over here. And before that, let me just remind you one more thing. So whenever we talk about the uh, uh, action over here, you want to avoid thinking that it's uh, assignments. It's actually a different variable where the becomes is going to happen simultaneously. But let's now see this particular example. All right. Now I have an event. Let's say it's no guard, unconditional, always enabled. And I, now I try to do some swap. Let's assume we got temp, we got x, we got y. We got three variables, integer, let's say. Would you say this is an appropriate event for swap? Well, it looks like it, right? You're gonna assign x to temp and then swap x and y and then assign one to be temp. Looks pretty, closer, pretty close to what, what, how you would do it in Java. Agree? All right. Can anybody tell me why this is actually wrong? If you do this in Rodent, you're going to be in trouble. Or it's not going to kind of verify what you want to verify. All right. So number one, this is inappropriate.
colon equal to should not be consider as sequential assignments. It's not the case. It does not really go like this is going to happen first, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen. In that case, we, we would have been doing programming. It's not specification anymore. All right? that's, that's not appropriate. But let's now use the before after predicate to help us. Okay. What will be the corresponding before after predicates? This on the left hand side, this on the left hand side, and also this on the left hand side. They are all post state value, just like the n over here. Right? So n over here is the post state value. Right? So now the before after predicate is simply going to be temp prime equals x. And when you, you want to put them together, it's like a, like a predicate. And also x prime equals y and y prime equals temp. Now, hopefully you can see that this is not really right. right? So what we are saying here is x prime equals y, this is good. However, y prime equals temp. And the temp over here is the pre-state value. The pre-state value, which has no relation or no connection to x. Temp is just a different variable. We have no idea what temp actually stores in the pre-state. So if you look at the before after predicate of the corresponding uh, the event, what you would think that's going to work is actually not working. Do we have any question about why this event here is not appropriate for swap? All right, if you know, have no question, what should be the appropriate way? Oh, maybe question first. Okay, yep. How about this? I'll give you one example. Let's say we got pre states and we got post states. And then we got swap. Let's say in the pre states, we simply got, let's say, the temp. We got x, we got y. Let's say x is simply uh, equal to 23 and y is 46. We want to swap these two. Temp is more like a temporary variable. It can be any value. Why don't I put minus one? Okay. And now, according to the before after predicate, we are saying the following. We are saying that the temp prime is going to be the initial value, pre-state value for x, which would be 23. And x prime is going to be the pre-state value of y, 46. And y prime is going to be the initial value, pre-state value for temp, which is minus 1. And that certainly is not what we want. All right, again, we really want to make sure we are, we are very clear about what this become really means. It has nothing to do with variable assignments, even though you might tend to think of it, but that's okay. But you don't, certainly don't want to think about its sequential assignment. It's not. It can certainly be turned into predicates with conjunction. All right, that's the most important thing to know. All right. All right, so hopefully that you understand a little bit better. But now, can anybody suggest to me what would be the appropriate way to specify swap? Someone? Override. override? No, we don't need override. But override wouldn't apply because we don't have a relation here. Mm -hmm. All right, let's now give you the answer. You can think about it. It's actually easier than you think. So, correct version. So, the correct version goes like this. All we got to do is we don't even need a temp variable. All we got to say is x becomes y, and 
Let me make it a little bit bigger. X becomes Y. Y becomes X. That's the correct answer. This might be very counterintuitive. I'm pretty sure if you simply turn colon equal to into Java variable assignment, you know that that's wrong. But again, this is specification. This is not programming. All right? So now, if you think about it, if you look at these two over here, it is simply going to correspond to before after predicates over here, x prime equals y, and also y prime equals x, right? Now, if you look at, let's say, a similar example over here, let's say this. Now, according, oh, let me just draw, okay? Let's now be clear. Now, based on this over here, if I got a pre-state over here, and I got a post-state over here, and I got a swap, now, let's say x equals 23, y equals 46. Now, what about x prime? Well, just initial value for y, 46. And what about y prime? It's going to be pre-state value for x, which will be 23. That will be the correct way of doing it. So I think that this will be a very nice example to really show to you whenever you're writing the event actions over there. Just remember to really always turn that into the corresponding before after predicate to think about if they make sense. So here, in the initial swap I gave to you, it might make sense if you think about it, it's just like a Java or C, but it's not. It's a specification language. It's not programming language, okay? All right, final recap. This is wrong because the before after predicate over here simply correspond to the wrong implementation for swap. If you want to do it correct way, that will be the correct way. And to justify it, you can see the corresponding before after predicate, and that's one example showing you how to run it. All right? That's uh, important to note. Okay. Let's now see what's left. Yeah, before after predicate, we talk about it, and let's now talk about invariant preservation. And the, there's only one thing I'd like to mention conceptually, and then we can move on to, okay. I would say let's go one more concept over here, very brief, and then we'll take a short break, and then we can start something a little bit heavier, sequence. That might be deserve a little break before that. Okay, let's do the previous slide very quickly. This one, really nothing uh, much to say. I just want to draw down one predicate for you, just for the conceptual idea, okay. What we're gonna do after the break is we're gonna, slide, we're gonna gradually formulate and pave the ground for you to formulate invariant preservation proof obligation. So invariant preservation over here, somehow it can be to be formulated as a proof obligation. And that is something we'll see either today or on Thursday. All right, and there's only one little thing I want to write down, so you can uh, just check that a little bit later. So what we desire is something like this. We want to say for every possible states, and then we say that the states is a valid one with respect to our state space. I'll give you an example in just one moment. That implies the invariance is going to hold on that particular state. All right, so now what about in this example here? So here we want to say the state space over here is simply that n is a member of natural number. It's more like a typing constraint. So the state variable here is just n. And we say that n should be a member of the natural number. And then we want to make sure the property over here is always maintained. And n less than or equal to d. In order for us to really find some weakness for that, we just need to find 
And if you remember, how do we disprove universal quantification? We want to find one witness, right? To disprove this. You basically want to find uh, states in the state space. But it is not the case, negation here, the invariance on the states. It's a little bit abstract, but it's good to put it down as a principle. You want to find a single state that's not going to satisfy the invariance. Right? Notice the, uh, the negation there. Over there. All right. Any questions about this? Okay, if no, why don't we uh, take a very short break and take attendance? And then after that, we can now talk about sequence to make everything more precise. Okay. Okay, let me stop the recording. All right, let's resume. All right, so before the break, we spoke about invariant violation. And now we're going to gradually try to make the proof obligation very precise. And we need some notation for that. And for those of you who learn about, I'm not sure, I can assume anything. But if you have, it's something called sequent calculus. But we're going to talk about, talk about it from scratch. I don't assume anything. All right, so we're going to talk about sequence mainly today. I got about, uh, oh, I lost my timer. Okay, I got about 20 minutes maximum. Right, I'm going to introduce to you about a sequence notation. It's very important to get a beginning part right. And later on, once we get more and more proofs done, there will be quite many proofs I can simply leave to you as exercise. You got all the solution on the slides. Okay. All right, let's now start with this. All right, let's now learn the syntax first. And then we'll learn about what it is, what, what's its meaning. All right, let's now take a look at the notation here on the slide. So there are two ways for you to write the sequence either vertical or horizontal. And both are OK. But I would say mostly, you will actually see the horizontal one. Let's now take a look. Right? I'm going to have some annotation for you. Okay. Oh, let's go over some definition, and they'll annotate accordingly. How about that? Okay. Just have my notes here. And you got H, and you got G. Right? By the way, do you guys know what this symbol is called here? This symbol here? Anybody? Proofs? No. It's called turnstile. And do you know why it's called turnstile? Okay. Just for what's worth. Oh, I lost that link. If you guys ever took some very old subway system, the gates, I'm not sure if they still have this in Toronto, but it's something that looks like this. Uh, let me just, oh, this one here. Sorry, my computer is a bit slow. This one here, that's called turnstile. If you ever, for example, you go to New York, maybe in Toronto, I believe some subway stations still got this. When you want to go into the station, rather than just scan your card, actually this, you gotta insert a coin and pass through. And this guy over here that can rotate, it's called turnstile. That's why people call this symbol over here, turnstile. I'm not making this up, that's actually true, all right? If you don't find it convincing, that's okay. I just want to show to you why people call it turnstile. All right, all right. So that's turnstile, and then uh, before we gotta understand what's to the left and also above the turnstile, and what's to the right and below turnstile. All right, turnstile, and then we got hypothesis and goal conclusion. Right? Let's now annotate it. Okay. Let me just see my pen. So it's here. Okay. Good. So we just said that this guy here is called turnstile. And later on, we'll see that that simply can be formulated as imprecation. OK, but we'll do that a little bit later. So the H over here is called the assumptions or the hypothesis. And the G over here is called a goals or conclusions. Okay. 
And one thing, I'm not sure if you noticed, I didn't put any singular form for these nouns. I put plural, which means for H and G, as we'll see later in the example, they, in general, each represent a set of predicates, each one of them. So for the H and also for G over here, each one of them, each is a set of predicates. And we'll see concrete example very soon. Oh, I can give you one. How about that? Right away. So one thing I can give you right away is this. Example over here. Let's say, let me use the vertical form. I got a turnstile over here. And then for the goal, I can have something like D is a member of natural number. N is a member of natural number. Also, N is less than or equal to D. Well, you can see I got a set of predicates, okay? And there is some implicit conjunction between them, all right? So I just put separated by a new line. And what about the goal? The goal is N plus one less than or equal to D. Okay? This set here just happened to be a singleton set. So this is which contains a set of three predicates. And this is the goal of the sequence, in which case it's a singleton set with one predicate. All right, just clarify. In general, it could be as many as you like in general. All right, so that's about syntax, pretty easy. And what about the semantics? How do we understand it formally? The semantics is also very simple, simply defined. We'll simply put like this. So if I say H turnstile G over here, itself is also a predicate. And then we say that that predicate, if and only if, H implies G. Okay, that's the meaning. Straightforward. And how do we interpret that? Assuming that H is true, G is provable. Of course, you gotta show it. If you cannot show it, that means it's not provable. In that case, the predicate will just evaluate to false. So later on, we're going to formulate each proof obligation as sequence. Now we're gonna see lots of them in the later part of the course. But let's now do something basic just to make yourself more comfortable for later. All right, so now for today, maybe of course you'll be very occupied for the test tomorrow, but after that, you want to really make sure you, under, you remember this definition here. Whenever I say this one here, I really meant this one here, okay? And a little question for us to think about. Very often, you might see a sequence like this, where the H part, the hypothesis part, is simply empty. It looks like this. Turn style. And then I only got G here. Okay, so that's why I said the hypothesis part over here is simply empty. You might see that quite often. And now the question is, what does it really mean when you don't have hypothesis being explicit? I'll give you two choices. Choice number one, it will simply mean true turnstile G. Or choice number two, 
false. Turnstile, G. Right? I'm just giving you choices. I can tell you one of them is the right answer. It cannot be both. What do you think should be the right interpretation of the sequence where the hypothesis is simply absent? You think of one or two? Two? Number, one, one, right? Okay, sure. But why do you think two is not the case? Oh, assuming edge is the case, right? Yeah. So false can be the case, right? So any other answer? I'll give you a hint. In order to really get this very 100% convinced, you want to go back to the meaning of sequence. Think about what this really means versus what this really means, and which one might make more sense. You think number two make more sense? Sure, I agree with you. Okay, so now, let's now do this one here. This one, by definition, is simply false implies G over here. But remember, we got the identity uh, like a zero of, uh, you know, zero of the uh, implication. So this one here, it simply means true. This one is a bit peculiar. That means by writing this down, I'm basically saying nothing to prove. Then why do you write this down in the first place? Right? On the other hand, if I got here, this is equivalent to true implies G. And we learn about identity of imprecation. That one is simply equivalent to just G. If only G alone, we are basically saying G is itself provable without any extra assumption or hypothesis. So that's the right interpretation. So we are saying that whenever you're seeing this kind of sequence over here, it cannot really mean the hypothesis over here is simply false because when the hypothesis is really false by definition, you don't even need to write this down. You're just saying G, everything is provable, not just G. On the other hand, if you actually say, if I got this one here, that means I want to show G is provable, all right? A little bit tricky, but it's important for you to know. Nothing to prove. All right. All right, so that's about the syntax, right? Pretty straightforward. So guys, any question here about the syntax? We good? All right. All right, I would suggest that we can do, how about, uh, let me see the time here. We got 10 minutes. What, what about do one more thing? And then we can uh, call it a day. Okay, I'll get to inference rule maybe on Thursday. That will be a more natural uh, evolution of that. Okay, how about we just do one more thing? That'll be good. Let's now try to practice a little bit to see how the sequence can be formulated. But later on, we're going to see precisely how, how it should be done. Let's say this will be more what we call informal sketch about invariant preservation. So this part over here is the rule. So here, this is the name of the proof obligation. It has to do with invariance. And then it's a turnstile. And then we got hypothesis. You can see over here, we got axiom. All the axioms should be included. In this case, we only got axiom zero. That's the only thing we got. And also we say that we should really include all the invariants at the pre-states. They should be satisfied. If you remember the exercise we did earlier, that's kind of connected. Let me show to you. If you remember this example here we did before the break, 
you can see this is invariant in the pre-states, and this will be invariant in the post-states, but all the relevant variables should be substituted by the action of the uh, events, right? That's something we said before the break. All right, so now let's see this one here. So invariance, what we have is somehow we have to take this invariant here and also only put a pre-state. I'll show you how to do that in just one moment. And also we got the guards of the events. The guard can also be assumed to be true. Otherwise, the event wouldn't even occur. So now let's say for ML out over here, there's no guard. So you'll be as if it's actually true. All right. And what about the invariance in the post states? The invariance in the post states, in that way, we are still going to refer to the invariance, but we go, we are going to somehow use the prime variable. So we're going to refer to this one here again and this one here again. And let's now try to formulate some sequence as an example. All right. And the idea would be you want to make sure every event is going to maintain the invariance. So now we, we're going to need two sequence, two of them. So I'm going to need a sequence number one, ML out. And then I want to make sure it can maintain the invariance. This will be number one. I got another one over here, ML in. And that one there should also maintain the invariance. Let's at least do this one here. OK. Yeah, we still got some time. Okay, let's finish that. Just this one here. What will be the axiom? It will be D is a, a member of natural number. All right, also we got invariance satisfied in the pre-states. So this will be just N is a member of N, okay? N is a member of natural number. And also we got the guards of the events. What's the guard for ML out? We know that it's simply just true. You can also put true over here, that's okay. Nothing wrong with it, it's just a predicate. And then we got our turn style over here. And now this will be tricky. How do we work this out? This will be the easier example than just the withdrawal. The post states. What, what I would normally do is, let's just copy down the invariance. And here we can choose to do just, uh, let's, let's say we do both invariants. So we got n prime a member of n. And n prime less than or equal to d. And so here, I can just add another one here, beg your pardon. So here will be n also less than or equal to d. So in the hypothesis, we got one, two, three, and four, four predicates. In the goals, we actually got one over here, okay? Notice one thing here. n here is a pre-states. And the n prime over here is the post states. However, whenever you give me the sequence, it should not contain any post state value. You should somehow convert it back to in terms of pre states. How do we do that? Not difficult. So now, if you look at this one here, just this part. Because we know by definition ML out has the before after predicate M prime is in, in, equal to M plus one. So I'm just going to replace M prime by, by M plus one. So M plus one is a member of natural number and also M plus one less than or equal to D. All right, so that's a star part. Let me write down the whole thing and then we're done. So this will be the final thing you want to have. And the main thing for you to know how to do is to say how to really get this invariant satisfying the post states. That's the most important thing. We're going to do a uh, formulation like that many times later. So D here, N here, and less than equal to D, and also true, 
turnstile. And then m plus 1 is a member of n. And also, m plus 1 less than or equal to d. So that's the final one. All right? Exercise for you. Can you try to formulate MLN? And then invariance. And the only thing that you're going to find difference is how you formulate the invariance satisfied at the post state. Because now, the effects of the events is going to be different. All right? You want to complete that exercise before Thursday. And we're going to continue from here. All right, I'll see you in the lab session tomorrow.